That was a beautiful piece, but I think Wes made it better with the words that he wrote to fit in with that beautiful piece by Beethoven. Welcome to this service of worship and remembrance of Wes Hummel. Thank you for coming. For our call to worship, I invite you to see in the bulletin this passage from Revelation 21. The Apostle Paul, or excuse me, the Apostle John saw a vision something that Wes is seeing right now. Those who believe biblically in Jesus will also see it as well. So I invite you to please stand as I read this passage from Revelation 21, as it serves for our call to worship. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Please remain standing and find a red hymnal in the pew and turn to number 499 as we sing together Rock of Ages.
Our great and mighty Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have come to this sanctuary first and foremost to worship and adore you. And we give you thanks that you have cleansed us from guilt and the power of sin. And we cling to the cross with the assurance that we will one day see what the Apostle John saw in heaven, but only because of the merits of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Will you be pleased with our worship and make your presence known in this sanctuary through your body, the church, and especially so that the humble family will know your comfort as we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. And please remain standing now as we will be reading together Psalm 23. I've asked many people that I visited in the hospital, what's your favorite psalm? Invariably, the answer is always Psalm 23. So you'll find it printed in your worship guide. Let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Isn't that comforting? We shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please be seated. Well, those green pastures will likely make you think of a garden. This was one of Wes's favorites. So let's turn our attention to this hymn of comfort. I invite you to sing together.
can almost see Wes sitting back there in his normal spot with a big smile on his face right now as we sing that song. Let me read some of his favorite scriptures. First of all, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And then 1 Corinthians 1, 18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Well, what is folly to those who are perishing is the wisdom and power of God for those who are being saved. And I trust you are one who sees the cross as that wisdom and power of God. I invite you to please stand as we sing together the old rugged cross. <laughs>
I am honored to say a few words about my friend and brother, Wes Holm. I speak of him both in the present and in the past, in past tense. He was and Wes is. Wes was with us for a short while, for a short time. He is with our Lord for eternity. Of the many qualities I can think of that apply to Wes, three stand out. He was blessed with a great memory. He could recall in details events and names of people who crossed his path many decades ago. He had the gift of learning. He was an excellent educator, well versed in the disciplines of political and social science. But he loved philosophy as well, and ethics, and logic, and languages, and cultures. He was a Renaissance man, a Renaissance man in the best sense of the word. He was a learned learner, always desiring to learn more and to share what he had acquired. He was generous and kind-hearted, quick to offer words of encouragement and comfort when needed, and quick to offer time and treasure when the needs arose. My wife and I got to know Wes and Jane through our years of small group Bible study in our homes. That was a blessed time of learning and growing and fellowship for all of us. There is much truth in the old saying that we get to know people more quickly and more deeply when we find ourselves in a foxhole with them or when we share mountaintop experiences. In getting to know Wes, that mountaintop experience occurred for me when we were on a mission trip to Bulgaria in 2005. Our group went at separate times, but we all assembled together in Sofia to meet with the local missionaries there and pastors. And then we went up into the mountains, the Rodobe Mountains, to serve and churches in Belen Guaya primarily, and then Rakitovo. The week's activity in Belen was much like we had last week here with the children's uh, summer school program, except that in, in Belen the day's programs were filled with activities and Bible studies for children as well as for adults. And at night, there was <coughs> glorious long-winded preaching, great singing, loud singing, and praise to our God. A great zeal was shown for God in those meetings. Wes and I paired and shared our testimonies and helped in the language classes. It was during those teaching and sharing sessions that I got to know Wes a bit more and more deeply. He and I also paired to go up and further into the mountains of the Rodoba Mountains into Rikitavo, and it was there that Wes shared his testimony and uh, did some teaching late into the night, uh, and the people seemed to not want to go home. They continued to ask questions and wanted to comment. But finally, after a long, long time, we were finally able to break away and drive back to Bellingham. But we were in great amazement at the zeal that the people had. They were on fire for the gospel. We saw the same hunger for the gospel back in Bellingrad as we interacted with the people there in our teaching and sharing and, and preaching. Wes and I came in contact with a young lady in Bellingrad who was just graduating from high school. She had a very high grade point average. She was a new Christian, but very, very serious about her faith. She wanted to continue her education, but not financially able to do so. And after a year of applications and immigration forms and so forth, she was able, finally, to able to come here to go to school. And it was the kindness and generous 
financial assistance for travel from Jane and West that allowed her to come here. Bessie attended, her name was Bessie Romanova Chileva, and she went to school in Kansas City. And it was on the trips to Kansas City to, to pick her up or bring her back that Wes and I got to know each other more deeply. Perhaps that was our foxhole. He could not escape me, and I could not <laughs> escape him. We would talk about our loves, our passions, great books. He was a great reader, great books, movies that we loved, songs that we loved. And one of the movies uh, of that era, a little earlier, going back to 1960s actually, that was a movie some of you may remember called A Man for All Seasons. And the idea of a man for all seasons was the idea of a man who stood firm on his beliefs, all during times of great stress and turmoil, good times and bad. In that light, standing firm on his beliefs, his faith in our triune God, West also demonstrated to me that he was a man for all seasons. More appropriately, West was not only a man for all seasons, but, but, but West is a man for all eternity. In our drives, in our foxhole, West introduced me to the country gospel artist, Alan Jackson. He was one of West's favorite artists, and he also, in listening to Alan, became one of my favorites as well. And as also as I thought of West these last few days, I thought of the old gospel song written by Rufus Cornelius, Cornelius way back in the early part of the last century. The chorus of that song captures our longings for and satisfaction that we have in our Lord. The lyrics are, Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares are past, home at last, ever, forever, to rejoice. Thank you, Father, for giving us Wesley Walter Hummel for a season. We look forward to seeing you and him, not just for a season, but for eternity. You, our precious Lord, be forever praised and glorified. Amen. Dad was outgoing, witty, congenial, 
and enthusiastic about the things and people he loved. He believed that one of the biggest determinants of future success is the ability to delay gratification. I actually think that's how he acquired my mom as his life partner. He waited patiently until she was done dating that other guy, Charlie. <laughs> and then he swooped in, made his move, and snatched her up. Together they raised three daughters. And he took his role as father very seriously. We always knew what was expected of us. And we always knew when he was pleased with us. Kiddo, ya done good, he would say. When we were girls, when we girls were kids, he helped coach all three of his daughter's softball teams, spending hours at our practices and games, and in the backyard throwing us grounders and fly balls. He taught us to fun and to do a delayed steal, but more important, he insisted that we hustle and be a good sport, regardless of the outcome of the game. But Dad also liked to play around and have fun, too, during a ball game. Sometimes when I was on deck to bat, Dad, with a twinkle in his eye, would give me a little piece of black licorice and have me chew it up and then spit it out right, right in front of the home plate as I stepped up to bat. I guess he wanted to make sure that I looked like a real ball player. In addition to softball, Dad taught all three of us girls to water ski at the Lake of the Ozarks. Later, after Mom and Dad bought their lake house, he helped teach all six of his grandchildren as well. And speaking of the lake house, that was certainly an object of Dad's enthusiasm for the 15 years they owned it. Some of you here today can recall the warmth and fun of being a guest at the lake house. Both Mom and Dad enjoyed the water and loved sharing the boating, swimming, skiing, and especially the beautiful sunsets with family and friends. Although we three girls called him Dad, there were others who looked up to him in much the same way. One of them was an employee of his named Stephanie, who he cared about and mentored. One year for Christmas, Stephanie gave him an engraved mug that said, to a boss who was like a dad. Whenever I saw that mug on the mantle, it spoke volumes to me about my dad's kind character and influence on others. I know that Stephanie is not the only person that dad took under his wing. John just spoke to us about Bessie but there were many, many others. He was also a second dad to my own two kids. And over the years, I even remember a seven-year-old neighbor who would knock on the door asking if my dad could come out and play. <laughs> it was also important to dad to make a positive impact on the world. His greatest joy was imparting knowledge and wisdom through his teaching, but he also participated in a variety of helpful works including delivering meals for Meals on Wheels, helping at the Sunshine Mission, where he taught men things like how to buy a car and how to go on a job interview. He also volunteered for Mission Gate, a half a house for women. He helped maintain the property by painting the walls and finding decent furniture, and he opened up a transom so the kitchen wouldn't be so hot. In addition, he and my mom went to Juarez, Mexico, to do mission work, and later Dad went to Bulgaria, of course, as John mentioned, on those mission trips. In later years, as Dad got older, macular degeneration impaired his eyesight, and he struggled with diabetes and heart disease. But in spite of the challenges, he never gave up his firm faith in God and his pursuit of purpose. He somehow found a way to adapt to whatever was thrown at him. Now that doesn't mean he didn't get frustrated and impatient sometimes, as I can tell you that he did. He was human like the rest of us. But he adapted using Siri, Alexa, and his cell phone to stay informed, organized, and connected. When he could no longer drive a car, he maintained independence by riding a scooter to nearby places like the YMCA or McDonald's or Elo's Pizza. At one point, probably about four years ago, Dad took the scooter to the mall to get some orange chicken from Panda Express. When he left the house, he had apparently forgotten to shave, and he had a serious case of bedhead. I'm not sure what he was wearing that day, but I will just say that the employee
employee at Panda Express tried to give the orange chicken to him for free because I guess he thought that was a homeless guy. We had a good laugh about that. And I think he was more careful after that when he left the house. When all his health, with all his health issues, Dad never thought he would make it to 86. In recent years, I think he knew he was living on borrowed time. And true to his character, he wanted to make the most of it. And he did. Even with all the limitations of a failing body and a global pandemic, he knew how to make things happen. And even though he is gone from this earth, I believe he's still making things happen. The last couple of years, a lot of his sentences began with, when I kick off, followed by a directive. He made sure we knew his wishes. And that's making a, a tough situation a little bit easier for us. I love my dad very much, and he was our anchor. He was my favorite hero. So dad, I know you're up there. You done good. <laughs> Since Terry was planning to tell you about a variety of memories with our father, Wes, I thought I would speak about one specific memory that is meaningful to me. I want to tell you the story behind the lyrics that you see on the first page of the bulletin that Bill made reference to. Lyrics my father, Wes, <laughs> wrote to go along with the composition commonly known as Beethoven's Pathody. The longer official name is in the bulletin, and I didn't want to attempt to pronounce it out loud for you. Since my father was legally blind in his later years, it has been a blessing, as Terry mentioned, for him to be able to ask Alexa for all kinds of things, and especially to play songs for him to enjoy. He really enjoyed this Beethoven tune, telling me that he found the melody so beautiful, and it was the one, one he would ask Alexa to play frequently. So less than a year ago, when I had come to visit, he told me that some words had come to him for this tune, words that expressed his heart. He said they came really easily for him. He wanted me to write the verses down on paper for him and then sing them along with the tune to see if I thought they would work. And they did. As we were in the middle of this, my sister Terry walked in and mentioned she thought she thought soft. She thought the tune sounded like a Billy Joel song that she remembered. Sure enough, as it turns out, my father was, was not the first one to put words to this tune. Billy Joel did beat him to it. But my dad's lyrics were much better than Billy's, at least to me. They declare the basic truth of the gospel message. My father, Wes, wrote it from his own perspective about his relationship with Jesus, but we know it is true for every person who believes and puts their trust in Christ for their salvation. The lyrics fit that way to have been too, and I wish I were able to sing it for you, but I'll just go ahead and um, speak those words. He knows my heart, speaking of Jesus. He knows my heart. He knows my every sin. My sins were all forgiven when I put my trust in him. I know his heart. He bore the cross for me. My sins were being paid for as he suffered on that tree. Christ on the tree. Christ on the tree. He paid the price. He died for me. I believe it gave my father pleasure to create a little something that could communicate God's truth that he had put his trust in, and that may also bring glory to God and point someone to the Lord. I think it often frustrated him that his physical limitations prevented him from being able to make the meaningful contributions to others that he would like to do. So I know he would be pleased that I can share this song with all of you. Even in his death, it was his desire to share with others the truth of God. When ordering his tombstone, uh, again in preparation, like Terry was saying, it was important for him to have it inscribed on the back. And for now, for those in Christ, there is no condemnation. Romans 8.1 
Thank you, ladies, for helping us to get to know your dad even better. And John, for your thoughts also about Wes. We're referring back to that old rugged cross. I think it's safe to say that those who do cling to that old rugged cross and who live under the shadow of the cross will find that it is well with their soul now and forever. And so I invite you to please stand as we sing that hymn, number 691 in the red hymnal, It Is Well With My Soul. deep 
questions. And thankfully, God's Word gives wonderful and profound answers in response to those questions. I think you can tell that Wes had a love for God's Word. If he had a great memory, he put it to good use by memorizing Scripture. I looked on the guest page of Schrader Funeral Home, and one person was astounded at how much Scripture that Wes had memorized. Many of you know he had a particular interest in prophecy. He also studied the book of Romans, and thus you find Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus on his tombstone if you visit. If you're interested in the study of God's word, and if you're interested in theology, then Romans, the book of Romans is like climbing Mount Everest. And in my estimation, chapter 8 is the summit. So, I invite you to take a short trek with me as together we consider the gospel truths that are found in the last nine verses of Romans chapter 8. And in this passage, questions are asked, rhetorical questions, deep questions, profound answers are given. And in finding these wonderful and profound answers, we also find great hope as we consider the love of God. So please listen as I read this passage. You can find it, if you'd like, in the Pew Bible. It'll be on page number five, number 944. This is God's Word. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No! In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's word. And the first question Paul asks in this passage is this, what then should we say to these things? Well, what are these things that Paul is referring to? Well, the first seven chapters of the book of Romans, and especially the verses 1 through 30 that precede Verses 31 to 39. Let's get, give just a small sampling. Verse 1, on the tombstone, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's very clear, isn't it? But are you in Christ? It's for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, in Romans 8, those in Christ have been set free from sin and death. Verse 4, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us through Christ. Verse 8 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Nobody's perfect. Every single person you talk to on this earth will agree with that. I'll come back to that in a minute. Verse 6, Christ takes us from death to life and peace. Verse 11, through Christ, our mortal bodies will be raised. That was our focus at the graveside earlier today. It's true of Wes. It will be true of you if you are found in Christ at His coming. Verse 14, we are children of God by the Spirit by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 18, our suffering in this world, in this life, will seem like nothing compared to the glory that's going to be revealed to us. It's been revealed to us. Verse 21, we will be set free from the corruption that's in this world. Verse 28, probably many of you know this by heart, 
We know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. And then verses 29 to 31, that great unbroken chain of salvation, foreknowledge, predestined, called, justified, glorified. What then shall we say to these things? We, we should say this. God is for us. God is for us because from eternity past, God has set his affection on his sheep and in the fullness of time, God sent his son, Jesus, to make sure that that chain of salvation remains unbroken. If you're in Christ, it's because you were foreknown by God. If you're in Christ, it's because you were predestined by God. If you're in Christ, it's because you were called by God, you were justified by God, you were glorified by God. It is all God's doing. So, my friends, know this. If you are in Christ, it's because of Christ. God is for you. Second question, if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, we could list many things, couldn't we? We could list people that might be against us, or circumstances that we're facing that could be against us, or the devil, even death. We could even be our own worst enemy. Sometimes we say that about people. They're their own worst enemy. We could be against ourselves. Paul gives the answer using very simple logic in the form of another question, and here it is. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In other words, in light of who God is, and if God is willing to give his own son what is most precious to him, then everything else will be easy for God to give. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gave, he gave his son. And it's really quite astounding when you realize that when God looks at humanity, when he looks at us, when he looks at you, what does he see? He sees everything. He sees sin. He sees a wicked heart. He sees divine judgment. God sees all of this. Now I know, and you should know, that Wes agreed with all of that. I can prove it. Right here, his membership application. Do you acknowledge yourself to be a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, without hope, save in his sovereign mercy? Yes or no? Wes said, yes. But God sees something else also. God sees the need for redemption. God provides the way of redemption. He did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up. He delivered him up for sinners. Jesus spoke of this in John chapter 10. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The Father delivered Jesus up to death, but Jesus of his own accord laid down his own life. He had authority to lay it down. He had authority to take it up again. If God is for us, who can be against us? The Father is for us. Jesus, the Son of God, is for us. The Holy Spirit is for us. In light of the triune God being for us, the answer is a resounding nothing, and no one can be against us. We see earlier in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. This means that what Christ has, we have. Think of those that you've put in your, your will. They are your heirs. What you have at your death will be theirs, or whatever you designate for them to have. Where Christ is, we will go. Where does he go? He goes to prepare a place for us, for his sheep. And you know, Wes knew all this as well, because that second question is, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Wes said yes. Third question in the passage, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who will bring a charge or who will bring an accusation against God's elect? Things like, you're not good enough. 
you're a sinner. Do you think God could love you? What about the time that you did whatever comes to your mind right now? The devil is called the accuser. He's described as a roaring lion, a deceiver, a liar, the accuser. God's answer to this question is very simple. God is the one who justifies. Romans 8 doesn't go through a litany of how you might be accused or how you don't measure up instead with six words. All accusations are answered and banished. God is the one who justifies. Now just a word about justification. Okay? I would say it very simply. Christ's righteousness is credited to your account. Christ's righteousness is credited to your account. What does this mean? Well, it means simply this. Because of Jesus Christ, because of his incarnation, because of his becoming a man and his living among us, his being tempted as we were, yet without sin, because of Jesus' death on the cross and atoning death for our sins and his resurrection for those who believe, they are justified. Christ's righteousness is credited to our account. Now, I have a very unique opportunity to meet a lot of people all the time. And I actually try to steer the conversation so that we can agree on this. Nobody's perfect. And if we can agree on that, I like to take it a step further and pose a riddle for the person. I you agree that well, nobody's perfect, right? I mean, you might go up to somebody and say, are you a sinner? And they might argue with you. But if you go up to somebody and say, do you think nobody's perfect? They're going to agree with you. Who's going to want to say they're perfect? <laughs> but I pose a riddle to them. I said, well, we both agree that no one's perfect. But here's my riddle. Only perfect people go to heaven. I mean, that's clear. But only perfect people go to heaven. In fact, I was talking to one of our pastors, David Barnes. He's going to preach on that. Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect this Sunday. Don't miss it. Only pre Nobody's perfect. Only perfect people get into heaven. Yet, heaven is full of people. How is that? And I just lay that out. And most of them say, I don't know. And it gives me an opportunity to explain justification. God is the one who justifies Christ's righteousness. Christ's perfection is credited to our account. This means that through faith in Christ, you have a righteous standing before God. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus and all of his merits. Jesus is your advocate. Jesus is your intermediary. Jesus is your justifier. Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus is your hope in this life and your hope for eternal life. Jesus is your all in all. God is the one who justifies. And we who believe biblically in Christ are the ones justified. The active agent of justification is God. The one, ones on whom he acts are his sheep for whom Jesus died. And therefore, no one can bring a charge against you if you trust in Christ and are in Christ. Now, one of the things that we had in common with West and Jane was the card game Bridge. And if you know Bridge, you play Bridge, you know that the pinnacle of Bridge is if you get a grand slam. Now, you can imagine with a name like that that that's, you know, a big deal. You made a grand slam. I'm not going to try to explain that to you because if I say you grand slam, you're going to think of what? Baseball. Baseball. So let me take have a little illustration. Let's say the manager, you want to be on the baseball team. The manager says, yeah, I'll tell you what, you can be on this team and you'll make $25 million a year, but here's your role. You're going to sit on the bench and whenever our team is up to bat and we get the bases loaded, I'm going to put you in as a pinch hitter and as long as you hit a grand slam, you stay on the team. You've got to hit a grand slam every single time. Well, it's not going to be long before you do what? You fail, right? You're off the team. But let's say Jesus comes along and says, 
Let me take, let me take Bill's place up to bat. And Jesus hits a grand slam. Next time up, Jesus takes you my place. He hits a grand slam. Jesus hits a grand slam every time because why Jesus is perfect. But then Jesus says to the manager, now I want you to take my grand slam and apply it to Bill's account here and let him benefit from my grand slam, my endless supply of grand slams. Fourth question, who is the one who condemns? Well, of course, we've looked at verse 1, mentioned it many times. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In John chapter 3, Jesus said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son of God. Who is the one who condemns? Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In John chapter 5, and it's on the cover of our bulletin. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life, whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know, not hope, wonder, doubt, question, that you may know that you have eternal life. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that and was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Last question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's a great question. Because for those who have believed in Christ, for those who's, for whom Christ died, those whom God foreknew and Love before the very foundations of the world were laid, those whom God predestined, those whom God called, those whom God justified, those whom God glorified. Who shall separate them from the love of God? Who? Who indeed? The answer is simple, but Paul makes it a long answer, starting with another question. Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors because Jesus Christ is the conquering hero. And in order to drive home the point, Paul finishes this flurry as he approaches the theological summit, the Mount Everest of this passage, by saying, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. He exhausted everything, but he just summarized it there. Anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. My family and friends, Wes had this assurance. Wes knew these verses. I wouldn't be surprised if he had the whole chapter memorized. He knew the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you know this love that Romans 8 is talking about? Now, it was mentioned earlier that Wes was an accomplished joke teller. He invited us to his 80th birthday party, and we were able to go visit that log cabin he was raised, stomped around in the woods out there with no running water or central heating, I think. No electricity, perhaps. At the end of he gave a little speech, very clever, it was fun to listen to at the lunch. And then he stopped and said, Now many people maybe ask me, like, now that I'm 80, what's next? Depends. <laughs> Great timing. I remembered that joke, but I want to turn it right now. What will happen next with you? It does depend on what you do with the Son of God. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. 
I've mentioned several times, believe biblically in Christ, because we misuse that word faith. You've got to have faith, keep the faith, brother. Believing biblically in Christ means you just give him your life. You follow him. You don't just trust him with your things. You don't just trust him with your circumstances. You don't just trust him with your health. That's fine. You pray, but let's face it, if that's all we do, as soon as the crisis is over, we forget about it and we go along our merry way. Believing biblically in Christ means you give him your life. He takes the steering wheel, so to speak. He takes you where he wants to take you. Ultimately, his promise is eternal life. He'll take you to heaven. Believe biblically in Christ. Please pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for the incredible truths that come through in a passage such as this. There are dozens of seminary classes that could be spawned off of this chapter. I pray that we would find comfort in them. I pray for those that may not know you or are certain of their relationship with you, Jesus, that they would be troubled by it to the point that they would come to faith in you, discover your love, and have your peace. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, we know that the love of God comes from a great and faithful God, so let's please stand and let's turn in the red hymn book to number 32 and let's sing together, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
with the family. And I want to start by saying, you know, I, I knew Wes well enough through passing him uh, in the church and having conversations and in Bible studies and evangelism training and occasionally we'd have a breakfast together. I knew him well enough to say this with confidence, his greatest desire for all of you is that you would believe in and faithfully follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. In Psalm 78, it expresses this powerfully. It says, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn. And arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God. Psalm 78 captures this idea that life is not about you. It's about something that transcends you. It's about Jesus. It's about passing along the faith. It's about the next generation. It involves having in mind future generations. Wes's life was not about him. It was about Jesus and trusting that you also would be followers of Jesus. That is Wes's legacy. And with that in mind, I want to read something that Wes wrote. He, he was quite a writer. He wrote, wrote up some nice things. I saw him at the, some of his, his uh, writing at the funeral parlor last night during visitation. And I, I hinted with you that I had this, and I'm not sure you've ever seen this. This was part of, it says, in my testimony. He put it in his membership application, and this is what he said. I have considered myself to be a born-again Christian for the past 15 or 20 years. I know my sins are so great that I deserve to spend eternity in hell. But I also know that when Christ was suffering on the cross, he was paying the price for my sins 2,000 years before I committed them. I know that to receive eternal life, I must repent of my sins. Attempt to sin no more. Turn my life over to him and put my trust in him alone and what he did on the cross for eternal life. My trouble was I didn't have assurance. Somehow I had serious doubts that the good news applied to someone as sinful as me. I had a very tormented soul. On the 700 Club on TV, I heard that some wonderful things were happening at a church in Smithton, Missouri. They had services every night of the week and people were being saved by the dozens. I drove the 150 miles praying to God to give me some sign that I would not have to spend eternity in hell. At the end of the service, I answered the altar call with about, a half, about half the people who were there. A young man put his hand on my shoulder and began speaking in tongues. I stood there silently praying that something would happen. All around me, people had come forward were crying, falling down, praising God, or mumbling, thank you, Jesus. But nothing was happening to me. Finally, the young man gave up, and he walked away. I turned around and walked out and drove home. I wanted God to give me a sign. Well, it looked like he had, and it wasn't very good news for me. Here I was in my 60s with a bad heart getting bad news about my future in eternity. I was down. Finally, on April 19th, 1999, I received assurance when I was in Rodney's, Rodney Stortz, pastor at this church, founding pastor, his Monday noon men's Bible study. From that moment on, I've had a peace and joy that is unbelievable. The past eight years have been the best years of my life. Looking back, I am convinced that God was working on me because I tasted how bad the bad news was. I can better appreciate how good the good news is. When I repented of my sins, I laid them at the foot of the cross. They no longer belong to me. My sins belong to Christ because he paid for them. And he has cast them in the depths as far as the east is from the west. So now, because I am in Christ and he is in me, there is no condemnation. God knows everything, and he could look at me as the scuzz bag that I am or was, but he chooses to see me as wearing 
the white robe that Christ has put on me. I now stand before God as if I am sinless. What a miracle. What a thought to start each day. What a thought to cause tears of joy. But God has been good to me all my life in so many ways, and I have no idea why. I could make a long list of the blessings God has bestowed on me, but none of those blessings compare to the peace and joy of having eternal life. I not, only, I not only have salvation when I die, but I am experiencing a foretaste of it now. It is well with my soul. My reaction to God's generosity is not only thank you, but what can I do to say thank you? I know whatever I do won't give me any brownie points with God, but like so many other people in this church, when you are on the receiving end of so many blessings from God, you have to do something. And I was surprised with this next sentence. I have found that when I can't think of something on my own, all I have to do is ask Pastor Bill Myers and he will put me to work. <laughs> it is a privilege to worship and fellowship at Twin Oaks Church, but it is the ultimate blessing to know that God wants me for his own. Praise God. Have you seen that? Well, we printed up copies for you and some nice paper. And you can take them and cherish them as to remember Wes and his testimony. What Wes is experiencing right now, described in our call to worship from Revelation 21, no one would want to deprive him of that as much as you would miss it. Losing Wes should cause all of us to long for heaven. For believers in Christ, that time will come soon enough. Until that time does come, I want to encourage you, Jane, I want to encourage you, family members, that losing a loved one, really, patriarch of the family is, is a big loss. It leaves a big hole, and so you need to obviously pay attention, and there's, a, there's an adjustment that needs to take place as you come to a new normal and a, a new equilibrium. Author Dane Orland gives some advice. He says the Christian life boils down to two steps. Step one is this. Go to Jesus often. Go to Jesus often in prayer. When you miss Wes, when you're sad, go to Jesus often. Give thanks for his life. Give thanks for his eternal life, his testimony, his assurance eternal life. Step number two is, repeat step one. <laughs> Realize that your dear husband and father, grandfather and brother and uncle and friend and fellow church member has taken his place before the throne of God to worship and serve him for all of eternity. He's at the feet of Jesus, worshiping Jesus right now. Let me pray. Father, I pray for comfort for the humble family, for their friends. I pray that you give them strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. For the benediction, I just want to highlight that the family invite you to join them in the fellowship hall immediately after service for reception to share your memories of West together. And now, joined by the love of Christ, I ask you to please stand for the benediction. Beloved in Christ, remember there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You can know that you have eternal life May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore.